The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. On behalf of RBCS, welcome to today's webinar on the scourge of under-tested software updates. I am Rex Black, president of RBCS, a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm serving clients ranging from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. Since 1994, we have delivered insight and confidence to hundreds of clients around the world. We have a team of international consultants who deliver customized training, consulting, and outsourcing services for companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. I'm the author of many books on software testing, as well as being the past president of the ISTQB. Attendance at today's webinar earns PMI PDUs. Thank you, Linda Thorne, for reviewing the materials for PDU status and for making valuable suggestions. Attendees will receive an email telling them how to claim PDUs, including the PDU code. PDUs are available for live webinar attendance only. Before we start the presentation, a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have any questions during the course of the webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time, but please note that they are answered only at the end. There's no need to ask for presentation copies. The presentation is on our new and improved website, rbcs-us.com. By attending this webinar, you are automatically registered for the next free e-learning drawing. Check your email over the next couple days and watch the spam filter. Hope you enjoy this free webinar from RBCS. This is our seventh anniversary of our free webinar series. We do these free webinars as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS, we are a not-just-for-profit company. So, software updates. We've all had them. And we've all had them go badly wrong, I'm sure. Everybody's had a software update that's uh, probably been, uh, in their opinion, worse than the flu. Um, and maybe harder to get rid of. <clears throat> Let's step outside of the software world for a minute and think about this from the point of view of the real world. Let's suppose that you buy a car. You go to a dealership, you buy a car. You're happy with the car. You're driving the car around. You think the car is great. Six days later, it's the middle of the night. You're asleep. Unbeknownst to you, somebody comes from the dealership. The person breaks into your garage. They do not have your permission to enter your garage. They just come into your garage. Um, the person removes the tires from your car, puts updated tires, which actually have holes in them. And he leaves and takes the original tires with him. So the original tires are not there anymore. You have a car that is undrivable, sitting there on its sad, flat tires, just like we see in the picture here. Okay. Now, if this were to happen, it would be considered a crime. It would be considered breaking and entering, uh, at the very least, vandalism probably as well, theft, uh, possibly grand theft, depending on the value of the, of the vehicle. Definitely a crime. So how is it that we let software companies get away with doing that to us all the time? So we're going to look at some examples of this and um, talk about some ways to maybe avoid it or reduce it. Now, just as a little background, I come by this um, righteous indignation about bad updates uh, in a very honest way, because um, I was I was there sort of at the creation in the in the late 1990s. Um, I was uh, working on a product uh, you see here. It's called the Eye Opener um, from a company called NetPliance. Maybe some of you actually had one. If not, you can take a look on the internet and get some information about it. It was an interesting project. We were ahead of our time in a lot of ways, and unfortunately ahead of the um, the internet infrastructure bandwidth um, because this was back when you know you still had to do dial-up and that was just too darn slow um, but um, one of the things that we were doing that was uh, pretty leading edge was um, putting a device out there that needed to be able to update its applications and its operating system um, what we would call now uh, over the air 
Um, basically, when a, a connection was established in the background, it would need to pull down updates and automatically install those updates in a manner that was completely in, invisible to the end users. Um, and what we were very, 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 very worried about was what uh, would now be called bricking the device. We didn't call it bricking the device then. We call it hosing the device, but it was the same idea, that we would download some sort of update and um, the uh, an application would be corrupted and, um, and uh, unfixable, basically. Uh, there would be no uh, path back out of it or that the operating system so itself would be um, corrupted. And in either one of those cases, um, if the device were to be uh, either not able to boot or able to boot but not able to run key applications like email and so forth, uh, what would have happened was that uh, uh, the devices would have been boxed up and sent back to our service center uh, to be um, basically hard-loaded. Uh, you'd have to go through the IDE connector on the back of the thing, uh, which, by the way, <laughs> said IDE connector was one of the Achilles heels of the devices, if you read the Wikipedia uh, article about it, which was true. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, anyway, if it had been sent back to us for repair, we would have had to actually reload uh, everything uh, and then send it back all at our expense to the end user, who of course would have been none too pleased with the whole thing. So, so it would have been very expensive to us and, and inconvenient to say the least to the end user. So we were very, very concerned about the risks associated with this and we tested the crap out of it. Um, we, we ran thousands and thousands of updates of apps and operating systems and, and we found bugs that were serious and would have uh, uh, definitely resulted in devices being sent back and um, those bugs were fixed. And uh, while there were issues once the thing went out, uh, as, you, as you can read in, on the internet if you want, um, as far as I am aware, in no case was a device bricked by something that, by an automatic update that was pushed to it. So, this mindset does not appear to have uh, survived um, or the demise uh, of the company or or uh, uh, served as a shining beacon to other companies uh, in the future um, because it certainly does not seem to be the case that this mindset is out there of you know test carefully especially with automated updates so let's look at some examples so um, 2012 um, um, remember Google and Apple were like besties um, and then they became frenemies uh, because um, uh, Google decided yeah you know um, that, that mobile phone world is big enough for more than one and a half companies and uh, uh, <laughs> or one one giant and the, and, uh, the seven dwarfs, as the old mainframe expression went. Um, and so uh, they decided that they would uh, have an Android phone. And so Apple um, had a little uh, temper tantrum and uh, decided that they were going to drop Google Maps. And um, so when they, um, in, in September 2012, when uh, they uh, the iPhones, um, installed uh, iOS 6, which again, automatic upgrade, um, Google Maps goes bye-bye and is replaced by Apple Maps. And then uh, as was well documented in multiple sites on the internet, uh, this did not go well. Um, so this <laughs> tech radar quote here, um, problems with, uh, with uh, Google Maps, or I mean Apple Maps, uh, directions that took them the wrong way. That could be an issue, especially if you were, say, driving your wife to the hospital to have a baby. That, that, that could be a problem. Or you're driving the ambulance to the hospital and you decide that your company has decided that you're going to use um, iPhones uh, as uh, navigational devices. Uh, Phantom Airport um, in Dublin. So you're trying to catch your flight out of Dublin and you go and go and go and, wow, it's not an airport, it's a uh, sheep in the middle of a field. Hmm. Missed your flight. Um, and then this is probably the, the most uh, potentially uh, uh, 
hazardous one if you're not if you don't have your eyes open anyway. Um, <laughs> Auckland's main train station uh, relocated into the middle of the sea. Yep, and and there have been instances uh, reported, and in, including one recently here in the United States, of people uh, actually following their GPS and driving directly into water. Uh, more recently, a boat ramp. Um, but you know, in this case, this was a systemic set of problems um, that were, um, you know, uh, worldwide in in uh, scope. Uh, so uh, Tim Cook came out and said, gee, uh, horrible, horrible, we're very sorry. They threw two people under the bus. Um, your guess, you, you know, take a guess as to who those two people were. I believe one of them, at least one of them was a uh, was one of the testers. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe for the people who were thrown under the bus, at least the bus was using uh, Apple Maps, and so it was going the wrong way and, and didn't run over them. Um, so at least, you know, this is Tim Cook. This is the newer, gentler Apple. Um, you know, Steve Jobs might have just built the new Dublin airport out in the middle of the sheep pasture and then and, and flooded Auckland. Said, look, it's underwater. <laughs> you never know. Um, now, I love the ending of this, too. So September 2012, uh, people get upgraded, quote, unquote, to Google Maps or to Apple Maps. But by December 2012, there's a Google Maps app, free app, which is now in the iTunes store and is soon the most popular free app. So there you go. So much for the upgrade. Um, now, you know, the one thing that people were saying about, ooh, Apple Maps, it's got this really cool 3D thing, or you can like 3D. Yeah, 3D the wrong way. Um, you know, there, <clears throat> when you're talking about functionality of, an, of a system, that, yeah, there's there's suitability um, and usability, and those are important characteristics. But accuracy, you know, with accuracy is sort of the without which nothing of any application. If it's giving you the wrong answer, uh, no matter how elegantly it's giving you that wrong answer, it's just uh, wrong. <laughs> okay. So, bricks. Yeah, bricks. Many bricks with people brick. So uh, here we here's Apple again um, uh, with their their watch, their Apple Watch, and this says three years later, um, and uh, the the Apple Watch has been out for five whole months, and right before they're about to update the software, they go, oh, well, wait, 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 whoops, wait, wait, stop, stop. We found a showstopper. Um, testers found a showstopper, um, and. So CNET, again, this is all extensively documented on the Internet. Feel free to, to look this stuff up. Don't, don't have to take my word for it. Uh, CNET says, um, so, mm-hmm, this sounds familiar. So iOS 8, you remember iOS 8? <laughs> so when iOS 8 launched, there were all sorts of bugs in uh, various functionality, including critical stuff like Wi-Fi and Touch ID. Um, and... Um, and then there was a sort of a panicky wait, wait, we've got that, which which turned out to be, um, you know, uh, kind of like dealing dealing with a, uh, a bunch of rats in the garage by throwing a Molotov cocktail into the garage. Um, so now you have you have burning rats in the garage in a burning garage. Um, so there's now more issues. <laughs> so scramble, 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 and then finally everything gets fixed. And so for apparently for about a week, um, some 10 million people were unable to use their phones. So, you know, yeah, that's a problem because you can kind of do the math as to what the uh, annual total cost of ownership of a phone is. And um, you can calculate what a week's value is and multiply that by 10 million. And that's basically the uh, usage and value that Apple deprived their customers of through this ill-tested um, set of, uh, of, of releases to iOS 8. Um, now, with regard to the watch, by the way, yes, there was, again, somebody thrown under the bus with respect to the watch. It was, wait for it, the test manager um, who was blamed for finding the bug late. Yeah. Now, of course, the developers were not blamed for putting the bugs in, but, but no, the test manager found the bug late, got publicly thrown under the bus, um, and so, you know, there you go. 
you know, moral of this story is um, you know, if you're in one of these working for one of these companies that's in the habit of under testing their automatic updates, keep your resume polished and your professional network updated because uh, you may be the uh, the the goat uh, tied up outside of the city and beaten by the uh, residents of the city um, because of the drought, which is the biblical origin of the phrase scapegoat. Um, now, <clears throat> just so that I can preserve my reputation as kind of an equal opportunity offender here, we'll move from Apple to Nest, um, which is a Google company. So you know, I've made fun of Apple at Google's expense. Now I'm just going to make fun of Google at Google's expense. Um, so Nest makes these uh, thermostats and uh, they had a problem in December 2015. Now for those of you who are down on the other side of the world, you might think, oh yeah, that's, that's kind of a drag, it's summer. Uh, December is the start of winter up here in the northern hemisphere. And um, so, um, yeah, it's kind of a time where you want your uh, thermostat to work. Um, so they, they pushed an update to this Internet of Things Nest thermostat, which apparently got it into that same kind of mode where, you know how like if you accidentally leave your phone on when you're on an airplane and it can't find a single and it's signal, so it's hunting, 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 and in so doing it kills the battery? Well... Something like that happened because these things got dead batteries, um, which resulted in some very, very cold houses um, in January. Um, some people weren't very happy. Uh, <laughs> apparently, there was a workaround, but the workaround was such that after it was posted on Nest's website, apparently they had to come back and go, well, yeah, you know, if you can't figure out how to do this yourself, uh, we'll pay for an electrician to come out and fix the problem for you. Now, <laughs> you know things have gotten to a uh, pretty bad place when, um, when that's the kind of thing that, that the company is stepping up to do because, um, you know, if it were just bad publicity, I can't imagine that that's what, what would have happened, right? I mean, there must have been something a little bit more serious there, like, I don't know, potential legal liability. I'm just speculating. Uh, so, yeah, you know, black eye, cold houses, um, out-of-pocket expenses for Nest, all, all fun and games here. Now, you could sit back and go, oh, geez, this is a total one percenter problem. <laughs> you know, oh, my house got cold because my, my Wi-Fi uh, thermostat uh, battery died. You know, <laughs> it's like, come on, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, the kind of thing that happens to people who are looking down at the Occupy, Occupy Wall Street people uh, from their, you know, um, 70th story offices. Um, but there are um, some actual ramifications to um, people here because if, if one of these houses uh, happens to, maybe it does have a one percenter parent, but you know it's not the kid's fault and there's an infant in the house, I mean you know a freezing cold house, that's, that's a problem. Uh, similarly if they were installed in uh, nursing homes and that sort of thing, you know, that could be a problem. Now I'm not saying that this happened in this particular case, but it's, it's something that could happen and it's something that probably will happen more and more in the future. Um, now, <clears throat> what would have happened, say, if your house had frozen and um, a pipe had broke? Well, um, not sure why they actually had to send the electricians out to fix the problem. Um, that that maybe it was an oversight somewhere or another, um, or just they were feeling particularly generous. But had you actually wanted to sue for damages, um, you'd have been out of luck because it turns out that the uh, um, there's an arbitration clause in the uh, click wrap uh, agreement that comes with the Nest device. You know that, that, that box you check that you never read the text of? Yeah, well, it included an arbitration clause in this case, which basically said, no, no, you can't sue us. You agree to allow us to basically slow walk you to, you know, the gates of Dante's Inferno um, with the, with the arbitration, or you can accept, you know, three dollars as damages. Uh, I'm being a little harsh there, but you know, if you don't believe me on this, there was a fairly recent expose on the the evils of these these uh, 
uh, uh, shrink wrap, click wrap um, agreements that are sometimes called contracts of adhesion, contracts where you cannot negotiate. There's no way to negotiate the contract. You either accept it or, you're, or you, you, know, you can't use the, the service. Um, I believe it was the New York Times that did this. There's a fairly large series of articles exposing the abuses of this, not only by, by software companies, but uh, most especially by cell phone companies uh, and, and uh, mobile uh, providers. So, you know, this is, um, of course, made worse by the fact that it, it, it effectively reduces um, the company's incentives to get it right to begin with, which I'll come back to later. So, you know, I picked on Apple and I picked on Google, so now it's Microsoft's turn. So th this is kind of the event that, that spawned this um, um, particular rant <laughs> of a, of a uh, webinar. Um, I, I have uh, uh, a Windows 7 um, computer. Well, I have a Panasonic Toughbook CF53. This is a great piece of hardware, absolutely fantastic piece of hardware and runs Linux like a champ. Uh, I've got another one, an older one, that uh, I've retired and have Linux running on. It runs great. I just wish I could get get away from Microsoft Office and all else Microsoft and be purely running Linux. Um, but unfortunately, I'm still stuck with the sort of the PowerPoint, Visio, Word, Excel, you know, axis of, of weevils, um, <laughs> other assorted bugs. And so um, I have this thing. It's running Windows 7 and Office uh, Office 365, uh, as they call it, which I guess is Office uh, uh, 2013. Um, and uh, it's the online version. But it, it downloads and, and installs on your system, so you don't actually have to be connected. Well, so anyway, Office Office. Uh, 2013 and Windows 7, this is not exactly a rare combination, um, which is usually I try to avoid having rare and unusual stuff on my system because that just involves or invites um, incidents like what ended up happening to me anyway. Um, so Windows 7, in November 2015, it pushes out a security update. And, um, you know, for those of you who know the song, you know, how much is that doggy in the window? Um, the, the next line is the one with the waggly tail. Well, this, this dog crap that got pushed onto my windows did not give me a waggly tail by any means. It was a, a big mess. Uh, basically, what happened was um, Outlook uh, stopped working. Um, so you see, so you, you can use Office now. You see the little that screen download there? No, actually, I couldn't. Uh, took me two days, three person hours of work. Uh, and the thing that was particularly irritating, and I, I dug into this and I posted a series of videos on the RBCS Facebook page if you want to see the, the documentation that proves what I'm about to say. Microsoft knew about this problem for days, like over a week, and yet said nothing about it. There was no kind of warning or anything. It was just, you know, they would force people to either put up with it, um, uh, being, and, and basically you could not use Outlook. I mean, you, you start Outlook, it crashes. Every single time I start Outlook, it crashes. So I'm stuck going out and trying to use webmail, except, of course, for the mail that's already been downloaded, which now I can't see because I can't start Outlook. Of course, I can see it if I go take the computer offline uh, because what causes it to crash is any attempt to connect to the Internet. But then how do I respond to the email? Oh, I can copy and paste it? And yeah. Yeah, it was, it was not good. Um, now... Let's do a little math here. Um, Microsoft says that one billion people use Office. So let's assume that just half of them are using Outlook for their email. Okay, so that's 500 million people. And half of people use Windows 7. So we say, okay, well, now we're down to 250 million people. So if everybody lost three person hours, just like I did, and, you know, I'm a pretty technical guy, so I think I probably had a, a better time of it than a lot of other people. Well, let's just say that three hours was was typical. We're talking about 300,000 person, person years lost. That's, um, yeah, that, that's a problem. That's a real problem. You can do the math on what the value of a typical person year is, but it's in excess of $100,000.
Okay, fully burdened cost of the staff here is in excess of $100,000. So, hmm, is Microsoft on the hook for billions of dollars in damages? Should they be? I don't know. Should they be? In the real world, if somebody did something, made a mistake like that, that cost companies billions of dollars, wasted billions of dollars of productivity, would they be on the hook for that? I think so. Okay, so now I have thoroughly beaten up um, big software for um, not doing a good enough job on this stuff. Um, well, let's look at what happens with companies that, and organizations that actually do a really good job on this. Are they, are they able to get away completely from these kinds of problems? Well, it turns out no. So um, NASA... Um, does the supports the software for the International Space Station. They uh, have releases, they have a yearly release, yearly software update, which is two years in the making. So they start the next one while the, the one that's about to be released has been in development for two years and there's one that will be released next year that's still in development, only a year into it. So, you know, release um, N plus 2 is started while release N plus 1 is one year into it and release N is about to go out. Um, so, you know, they're not exactly rushing these things out, but the February 2013 update killed the safety critical and mission critical um, apps excuse me, including communication software, hence the title of the slide. <laughs> um, so uh, Marcy Kerr, <coughs> excuse me, who's this um, software development manager who's in charge of the testing as well, um, said that basically there was a data allocation bug. So somewhere or another there was some data being allocated, some kind of malloc or something going on, and it had a... Um, um, bug in it and so they were mismanaging memory and so with this one line out of 4.5 million lines of code had a bug in it um, which apparently once they heard what the symptom was they were able to track the bug down pretty quickly and fix it pretty quickly but then it took a week to upload because you know this is a fairly big chunk of software and um, it, it takes a while to uh, send a big ch chunk of software uh, into space so Hmm. Lessons we can take away from them. Well, one of the key lessons, something that we have known for a long time, but we continue to have to rediscover as a profession, is that software is not linear. Um, you know, Boris Beiser talked about this way back in the 1980s with his book Software Testing Techniques, and he said that, you know, when if you're driving your car down the road and your car radio fails to uh, properly tune in a radio station, you don't expect a tire to blow out. But that kind of thing happens all the time with software. Um, little teeny problems and can, can uh, cause big, huge uh, failures in um, totally unanticipated parts of the system. Um, because software is just it's not linear. It doesn't behave like objects in the physical world. Um, now, you get organizations like NASA. Uh, NASA fo very carefully follows software engineering best practices, unlike you know most big software companies, most small software companies too, for that matter. Um, but even so, some stuff can get past you. Now, now that's not. And I think some people might hear that and go, "Oh, well, great. So we don't have to worry about best practices. Let's just shoot this garbage out the door and see what happens." Well, no, because this does work. I mean, if you look at NASA, um, there was a, um, there's a, a battleship, or not a battleship, aircraft carrier that's parked in New York City. I can't remember the name of it. Um, it's, it's at a dock. Of course, it's in the water. It's not, not on, the, on the asphalt or anything. And on that, they have one of the shuttles, space shuttles. And there was a plaque there, and uh, the plaque 
was commemorating the 17 people who have died, um, 17 NASA astronauts who have died as part of uh, missions. So uh, lost two on the uh, uh, Columbia and uh, two on the, or, excuse me, seven on the Columbia and seven on the Challenger and three on, uh, I believe it was Apollo 1. Um, and all three of those incidents were hardware failures of one kind or another. Um, uh, so the, the Columbia was ice uh, hitting uh, pads and uh, Challenger was uh, O-rings that were too cold. And uh, the Apollo 1 fire was um, uh, a short circuit that's caused a spark, which led to an oxygen fire in the capsule. Uh, so not, not a single person killed by bad software, which I um, mean, you consider the incredible risk uh, associated with, uh, with space programs. Uh, it's a pretty remarkable thing that they have only lost 17 people you know, out, of, out of millions of, of flight hours logged. And... Um, you know, and again, not not a single one of those deaths has been software related. I think if you if NASA built software the way that uh, pretty much everybody else in the commercial software world, save certain safety critical industries, builds software, um, you know, you'd need more than two digits to count the number of astronauts who'd been killed by bad software. Um, but the the bottom line here is um, that you know we're we're not quite of mature form of engineering yet and we need to get there because even when you do everything you apply all known best practices as NASA does you um, you, you're still going to have some bad updates in this case the NASA update didn't uh, uh, kill anybody um, but it could have um, now <clears throat> You know, so far I've been like talking about stuff, and yeah, it's you know, it's a, it's kind of the pain in the butt factor for the most part. It's scary with respect to NASA, but you know, implications are you know uh, kind of sketchy with respect to safety and so forth. But um, it, this really is it's going to get worse. Um, so you are starting to see now that. Um, the auto manufacturers, you know, they got a lot and a lot and a lot of software in their cars. You got, you got way more software in a, in a modern Mercedes-Benz than you had in the space shuttles. Um, and, uh, you know, infinitely more than in the Apollo missions. Um, and uh, there are all sorts of risks associated with just auto automatically updating um, the... Um, software beyond just functionality and reliability and, and we're starting to see that uh, auto manufacturers are doing that they're pushing automatic updates to the cars um, and it's like okay well hmm so there's some problems there in terms of the car's functionality the car's reliability at least some risks uh, how are they containing that well you know are they actually updating core systems some of them are some of them are just doing maps and telematics and those sort of things, but some of them are actually, you know, core like ignition systems and so forth. This same channel by which these updates are happening is creating some significant security risks. So July 2015, um, you got Wired Magazine, they published an article, um, got a, a couple hackers from, from a great distance without, not within visual range, but from a great distance away, managed to hijack a moving Jeep. Now, fortunately, the owner of the Jeep was in on the gag, and this was the whole thing, was to demonstrate the ability to do that. Um, and you can uh, go out and look at Wired and see what, what happened. They were able to basically shut the vehicle down. Um, so, you know, I mean, imagine the... the Imagine Anonymous, for example, in a, in a fit of peak, you know, say uh, Donald Trump wins the presidency and Anonymous decides this is completely unacceptable and they just hack into every single hackable vehicle and render them unstartable or unrunnable, wherever they happen to be, to just create mass chaos and, um, uh, you know, social uh, uh, distress. And that if that strikes you as far-fetched, Anonymous has already made some very... Uh, pointed comments about how completely unacceptable they find Trump. So, you know, this might be something that would be within the realm of imagination for them. That would be a big mess, okay? Um, so, you know, social disruption, potential terrorism. Um, 
Now, you might say, okay, well, cars, yeah, cars, yeah, okay, that's bad. Well, how about medical devices? Um, so June 2013, Vice um, interviewed a guy named Barnaby Jack, um, and he uh, said in that interview that he could hack into pacemakers and insulin pumps uh, and other medical devices and could indeed take control of them and cause fatal events. So we're not just talking about pranking here, we're talking about potential assassinations. In fact, when Dick Cheney had a pacemaker implanted, there were special considerations taken for exactly this potential problem. Um, now, uh, in a, a, a gift to conspiracy theorists near and wide, uh, Barnaby Jack, uh, one week before he was supposed to present his findings, which were teased in this, um, in this article, uh, with uh, in this interview with Vice, uh, died. Um, he's at, at age 35, um, which is a, a fairly unusual age at which to die, rather young. Um, now, so if you're a conspiracy theorist, you know you're probably uh, thinking of whatever that movie um, uh, was, or the, the the attorneys were representing the company that made the the, the toxic weed killer that caused cancer and so forth. Uh, I forget the name of it, uh, George Clooney and a few other people in it. So you might think that this is one of those sort of deals, um, or you could just take the toxicology report for it. That he, um, he had apparently had quite a party on the night he died, and he had cocaine, heroin, Xanax, and alcohol in his bloodstream, which um, I, don't, I don't even know. I mean, what's the order in which you are doing those in order to be able to do all of those? <laughs> Still be around to do the last one. Uh, so anyway, um, you know, regardless of the sort of the, the, the strange uh, uh, circumstances surrounding Barnaby Jack's demise, he was indeed a credible member, although apparently one a member with a drug problem, of the uh, software security community um, and, um, you know, had, had tremendous uh, um, uh, respect uh, in, in that community. He was indeed going to give a keynote speech at the Black Hat Conference uh, on this very topic. So that's scary. So you might say, oh my God, oh my God, these updates and these update channels, these are horrible, horrible, horrible. Let's just not do any updates. Well, um, we have some historic examples of what happens when you don't do updates, which uh, is not particularly... Um, happy uh, historical precedent. Uh, the more, the more uh, disturbing is the Therac-25 nuclear medicine device. Uh, so the Therac-25 was, I believe, the third generation nuclear medicine device. Basically, we could administer, if I'm remembering right, beta and uh, gamma radiation. So beta, beta radiation is basically ionized electrons as a stream, high energy stream of electrons. Gamma radiation is just, uh, you know, high, high frequency light waves, basically very, very high energy um, uh, photons, um, but high, high enough energy that it can be really, really dangerous. Uh, so the Therac um, device is able to uh, deliver nuclear uh, radiation as a form of medicine, which is, you know, obviously must be done with, with extreme care. Now, the two previous Therac devices had some hardware safety interlocks on them that would prevent accidental overdosing, but those interlocks were removed from the Therac 25. I forget the reason why. Um, had those interlocks been present, uh, the, um, what, what happened next wouldn't have happened, but then there was a bug, um, or actually I think, if, I think there were two bugs. There was some sort of usability bug and uh, a functionality bug. So the, the, the functionality bug could lead to inadvertent uh, overdosing and the usability bug made it impossible to see that you were uh, overdosing people. Um, and um, again, details available widely on the internet here. But, but what happened was that they, they reused software that was in the previous devices and added new software to it, um, took the... Um, the, up the the locks off and um, you know that set into motion a chain of events that resulted in some people being under radiated which is bad because you know you're being given radiation therapy for for cancer and other serious illnesses 
Uh, and it also killed three people, like like killed them through overdoses. And there's some fairly horrific uh, stories out there of, of what uh, um, what that was like for the people who were overdosed and for the people who came in to clean up the mess um, afterwards. Um, so, you know, this is uh, software that was not adequately updated. And then another very spectacular instance of software not adequately updated happened with the Ariane 5 rocket, which uh, reused uh, software from, I think it was Ariane 1, but I could be wrong. Um, anyway, the uh, the previous version of the of the Ariane rocket um, had uh, had a different um, processor, which had different data sizes for integers and decimal numbers. Uh, but they reused software from that, um, and this is there's always risks of portability problems when you when you do that when you have uh, data size sensitivity. Um, so what happened was that when they launched this rocket about a minute or so into its launch it started to tip over um, because there was a overflow that occurred uh, in a calculation and it says the uh, guidance systems were basically telling it to um, compensate in one direction but that was the wrong direction because it was actually now pointed more or less sideways and you can see in the picture here what what ultimately ended up happening to the thing it's a uh, you know, a half a billion dollar bottle rocket. And so there's a great video of this, um, and it is launched in French Guiana, and the guy recording it is French, and uh, is like, he's going up, and it's going up, and then it goes boom, and he says, oh, and then uses a French word that is kind of, kind of means poopy, but uh, a little bit more, more direct. Yeah, anyway, there's a, there's a very good video of it if you want to watch and, and see. I mean, you might as well. It was a you know, half a billion dollar firework. May as well get some fireworks out of it. Okay, so um, problems, problems, problems. Um, how about some some solutions, some thoughts? Um, now, I mean, eventually we are going to have to evolve from software as as basically a glorified craft, which is what it is now. And that's that's just completely unsustainable. You cannot you cannot build an advanced society and advanced civilization on crafts works. Uh, it's going to have to become engineering. So um, now, it's, and you say, well, why not? Well, you know, let me let me put it this way: if you saw somebody um, like hand making uh, steel beams and hand build, uh, hand creating and cement, hand smelting steel and and making their own do-it-yourself asphalt and rivets and such on the side of the road, would you be happy to drive over that bridge when he or she got it done? I think not. You'd be happy to go over the bridge because the bridge is constructed through using engineering practices and engineering materials and you can actually calculate what kind of forces it can hold up to. So eventually we need to get there, and I've talked about that before. But so what do we do, though? I mean, we can't just stop using software until we get there because what's going to drive us to getting there is continuing to use software and discover more about it. But what we need to do between now and then is, of course, um, get that attitude of there are known best practices out there that have been around a long, long time. Let's use them. Like, for example... Why are there people who are professional testers who get paid to test who do not know how to apply equivalence partitioning and boundary value analysis to their jobs? Makes no sense. Um, things that we can do to specifically address the kinds of problems I've been talking about, more automated regression testing, including system integration tests, especially when you're talking about application program interfaces and shared data. That's where a lot of this kind of stuff can go wrong. Uh, you update something and it talks to something else and it sends bad information to something else and kaboom. Um, if you got to go live with stuff that is um, uh, not thoroughly tested and God knows, I mean, given, uh, given the size of our software, basically everything's going to be not thoroughly tested to some extent, at least use things like A-B testing, beta testing, and other forms of stage releases so that you can limit the number of people exposed to the risk. Just hurling under-tested crap out there to millions and millions of people all at once um, 
certainly is is a, a sign of not not caring a whole lot about um, uh, who's going to be impacted uh, by that. Um, increased testing skills for programmers and increased programming skills for testers. In other words, program testers with better insight into how software works and how software doesn't work so they can write more insightful tests. And um, uh, programmers who uh, have a better um, insight into how to better unit test their code and and how to better integration test their code. Um, slow it down. This manic hamster wheel, you know, throwing garbage out there as quickly as possible. Um, you know, just it. This this idea of fast failure that has turned into, you know, quality doesn't matter. Just throw uh, spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. This is not not helpful. It is wasting people's time. Um, this is something that could, uh, would make a big difference. Uh, allow user end users to actually turn off updates. I have update automatic updates turned off every place I can find to do it, but still sometimes it gets forced. Um, so I want true end user control over updates. If I say do not update this without my explicit permission, then it should be impossible for an update to occur. Um, and one of the things that drives this this panicky, oh my God, Jesus, we got to get an upgrade out right now kind of attitude a lot of times is lousy software security and the discovery of security bugs. So let's get more serious about writing more secure software so that we don't find ourselves in this situation where we're throwing Molotov cocktails at, ants, at rats' nests in our garages to try to get rid of the rats. Um, so... You know that's that's surely a big um, a big cause of this problem. Um, it's also important to stop this lousy silver bullet search that we've been on. I mean, over the last uh, thirty plus years, it's been one silver bullet or the other. I mean, in in the eighties and nineties, object oriented programming languages were going to save it save us from from all this horribleness and. We're going to have all these pre-tested little objects that could be snapped together like Legos to build perfect software. Uh, really? Has that worked out? Did Java and C++ deliver that? Uh, I think not. Um, and now the latest one, of course, is life cycles. So we had a number of years, start, again, starting in the 90s with CMM and then CMMI. Oh, we'll get the process perfect and then everything will be great. Just like in manufacturing, yeah, except in manufacturing they're building objects that are made out of, out of standardized engineering and manufacturing materials that have predictable properties. So this idea of getting the process perfect through CMM, CMMI, or some variant of Agile or Lean or something like that, and that's going to magically make all of our problems go away, uh, this is just delusional um, horse droppings. That is not going to happen, and the more time we spend trying to look for some quick fix through some magic life cycle or language, it's time we don't spend doing the hard work that we already know how to do. Now, um, if I were king for the day, could uh, pass through some legislation, what would I do? Um, these are all things that would have to be done through legislation. They're not. They're not going to be done by industry. In fact, industry would be um, would spend every last dime that they had to try to stop these things from happening. But if if I could make them happen, uh, these this is what I would do. Um, I would require every single regression bug uh, to be publicly reported in a standardized database with standardized scales of severity and priority and classification of those defects to which the companies were under threat of criminal prosecution required to report their regression bugs. So that at least we could start looking at what's actually going wrong because right now what you hear about on the internet is it's not even the tip of the iceberg, it's the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Um, uh, certainly banning of all arbitration clauses in any contract of adhesion. Again, a contract of adhesion is one where you don't have an opportunity to negotiate the contract. You simply must accept or reject. It's it, to, to deprive people of their right to, to recourse to the courts uh, in, in those circumstances is something that really ought to be unconstitutional already. Um, but if it's not, fine, then um, make it that way. 
again if I were king for the day. Um, an implied warranty of fitness for software with legal recourse for damages, just like we have for everything else. If you buy a washing machine, a dishwasher, a car, a bag of cornflakes, there is an implied warranty of fitness. Uh, now, um, if anything, software companies have been fighting very hard against this. This is probably the one that they would fight the worst because this is the thing where those of us afflicted by that Windows 7 update that killed Outlook could have gone back and filed a class action suit against Microsoft, again, if the arbitration clauses were not there, and um, gotten them to pay us all collectively for the uh, 300,000 plus person years of productivity damage done. Bet that would get software companies really, really serious about quality. Um, I like this idea too. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley requires chief financial officers to personally sign off under threat of criminal liability if fraudulent on all um, annual uh, financial statements which are released to um, shareholders, at least for, for publicly uh, traded companies. Um, I kind of like that. CEO has to sign off on software releases, say, yep, this is good to go. Yeah. No throw the test manager under the bus a la Tim Cook. Yeah, I, I kind of like that. Uh, also, it would be good if uh, Congress went back to Carnegie Mellon University and the Software Engineering Institute and say, uh, yeah, about that CMM, CMMI thing, uh, uh, process is all well and good, but process is not a silver bullet. So please um, uh, set set aside, you know, CMMI version 2.0 or whatever the heck you're working on right now, um, and look at stuff other than than process and don't and not languages either, um, and and you know, figure out where the where the moonshot is and and you know you missed it the first time because you bet on process as the moonshot. Now let's try something else. Now, how likely is any of the stuff that I just spouted off? Um, I think on the non-legislative side, uh, I mean, I think a matter of a combination of employee awareness of how to apply these best practices together with strong consumer pressure could help drive these. And ironically enough, that it's a hyper-competitive markets where this could really work. Um, if, if people would just, you know, not be in such a frenzy to get the latest version of X or Y or Z, but instead would just be insistent on a high level of quality. If everybody would say, you know, I get an app and I get an, or any sort of update to any application I use on PC or, or uh, mobile device or anything, if it's crap, I'm going to start tweeting about it. I'm going to start Facebook posting about it. I'm going to put tremendous social media pressure on these companies to actually test this stuff before they get it out there. I think the quality would dramatically increase. Uh, at this point, I'm you know one of the few people that does that. I know there's a, there's a few other people. Ben Simo, for example, is really good about when when crappy software gets out there, he'll he'll put a post out there. I think more of us need to do that and just basically publicly shame companies that release crap and expect us to test the bugs for them. Um, now, as far as the legislative stuff that I just talked about, that's just complete fantasy. Um, I may not be as high as Barnaby Jack when he um, unwittingly did himself in, but you know I'd certainly have to be getting close to that to believe that any of that stuff is going to happen. Um, and in fact, recent history is that we've just barely escaped um, the opposite. Uh, thank thank God for Kem Kaner in the 1990s, who had, had great personal and and um, financial sacrifice to himself. Uh, took on the tech um, companies who were trying to pass this thing called UCEDA, which was basically going to give uh, software companies a complete and total and perpetual pass on any sort of liability for quality problems with their software. So, um, you know, I think it's mostly going to be just kind of a rear guard action trying to avoid these powerful companies from, um, you know, getting getting the same kind of legislation uh, with regards to um, uh, software liability as they, they get with regards to, say, uh, um, immigration and visas and so forth, where, you know, basically the H-1B program, for example, is, is uh, you know, there thanks to people like Bill Gates and so forth saying, well, we have to have this. 
you know, they have not been able to prevail in the same way with respect to liability, but that's that's perhaps only due to want of trying, not um, absence of uh, willing um, helpers in uh, um, the political world. Um, the one thing that would, of course, lead to a tremendous change in uh, in how how this all works and how people look at software is if a lot of people started dying because of software bugs. Um, I mean, if there were you know large numbers of people killed because of things uh, that were related to software, um, you know, I think people would get serious about it. It's like what happened in the um, 1800s in Europe, uh, in the in the UK specifically, when the uh, bridges were collapsing, train train overpasses were collapsing because they were being made of cast iron, and it happened enough times that Queen Victoria said, basically, you know, we're going to have a royal commission on this, we're going to get together, and this is going to stop happening because it's unacceptable. Unfortunately, uh, body counts do tend to drive drive change. Now, finally, um, we need to stop saying stuff that encourages stupid behavior um, or half-assed thinking about quality. So here's some some stuff um, that uh, that is you can easily find this out on the internet. Uh, so this is a famous quote by somebody I can't remember who. He basically said, "If you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late." I can't think of anything any quote more antithetical to an ethic of, of quality first than that one. Um, another good one is that there's a, a site out there that shall remain nameless that basically says that even if you only have one hour to test an application, you can be confident in your work if you know our magic testing techniques. Uh, right. Um, in uh, Kent Beck's book on extreme programming, he makes this claim that test-driven development uh, can be used to develop automated tests that will catch 100% of the regression bugs. Because you can make any change you want, and you can have complete confidence. Uh, and then uh, recently, too late to update these slides, somebody made some sort of comment about, ah, you know, we don't really need to have a backlog or anything. If it's important, we'll get around to it. Yeah, right. Human beings never forget important stuff. That's, that's for sure. So, I mean, these are all the kinds of statements that we just need to stop making because they just push our profession in completely the wrong direction completely the wrong direction. This is not the way we need to be thinking about this and not the way that we are going to evolve into a true form of engineering. Okay, so that's my rant. And uh, to conclude there, uh, I hope you can see now that software updates do indeed carry significant risk to the quality of the updated systems. I gave you a number of examples of that. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say, given how frequently these things come up, I've just picked a few really uh, high-profile examples, um, I mean, you know, uh, searches can reveal many more. And again, it's the tip of the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg that's visible, all the stuff that you never hear about because one reason or another it doesn't get out there. Um, you know, that happens. So there's a lot of this happening. We're not doing enough. There's stuff we can do. Um, we uh, are exposing ourselves to even more risks. Um, beyond functional regression by doing this because now there's security risks as well. So we need to get serious and figure out ways to update software that, uh, do, that re reduce the risk uh, by applying the kinds of best practices that I talked about. And I think we need to keep in mind that as a profession, either we can figure out how to manage the risks or regulators will do it for us because that's kind of been the history in, in industries that as, as industries get more and more uh, important and influential in society um, that, uh, you know, they're, they're less and less allowed to just sort of operate on their own and eventually what happens is regulations and we can either be self-regulated, in other words, by rules that we come up with and adhere to, or we can be regulated from the outside. Uh, certainly, um, not only do we need to address these risks, but we need to also start talking like we care about them and stop saying stupid crap that makes it sound like um, we are a, a bunch of, of amateurs um, um, playing playing games that don't matter because, in fact, what we're doing is is working on the, the infrastructure of civilization now. And we need to start acting like it, and we need to start talking like it. Okay, so I'm going to put the advertisement up, and I see we've already got some questions and comments coming in here. So... I've got one from Amit who's always good at 
good at throwing me some tough questions. He says, um, question about the introductory metaphor, the one about the uh, the, the dealership the sneaking in and, and taking the working tires off my car and replacing them with holy tires. It says, when comparing software updates to tire replacement, what if I bought the car and signed a contract requiring the mechanic to keep my tires fresh and up to date? In such a case, putting holes, uh, putting tires with holes on is simply a mistake, not a crime. Indeed. But what if you bought a car and you were asked if you wanted to opt for the automated update of your tires and you checked the box that said, do not automatically update my tires. Let me choose when to update my tires. And your tires got updated anyway. Because that's what happened to me with that Windows 7 upgrade. I have I have checked the box that says, go ahead and download the updates, but let me choose when to install them. And it went ahead and forced that update anyway, broke Outlook, and then for a week, Microsoft basically kept that to themselves and didn't admit that it was a problem. You had to call tech support, which was a whole other adventure. And again, you can go out to my Facebook page and listen to some of the video recordings I have of those abysmally bad tech support calls. But you had to call tech support and wade through um, hours of incompetent tech support before you could actually get the problem solved. And again, remember, I had said, do not change my tires. <laughs> I will choose when you change my tires. So I think that, that makes it a different situation. Uh, Tom McCann, longtime listener, says, thanks, Rex. Probably the best webinar you have delivered. Of course, he said that a half an hour ago, so he might have changed his mind by now. So this may be my last, however, as I'm transitioning to project management. Please forgive me. Well, Tom, no forgiveness is required. Uh, of course, if you are in project management, most of these um, um, webinars do uh, have PMI PDUs. So if you've got a um, PMP certification to keep up to date with uh, PDUs, and this could be a good excuse for tuning in, um, uh, many of them do these these. Um, do have some sort of um, project management element to them, so hopefully they will still be of interest to you. But if not, Tom, uh, best of luck with your new job switch, and um, hope all that works out very well for you. And uh, of course, if as a project manager you need some help from the, on the testing side, you you know who to call. Um. <laughs> okay, so I mean. <laughs> Amit says, uh, I think it's the third time I hear you mention that software development is not a true form of engineering. Once in the last rant about why software quality still sucks. <laughs> and there I got a pointer to listen to the webinar towards a true form of engineering. Right. Are the extra costs imposed by such rigor worth the effort? Might be so in NASA or safety critical software, but who would pay that cost for their operating system? Well, I mean, I think the kind of stuff that I was talking about um, on the um, third to last slide, the one about the sort of the engineering solutions, uh, this is not going to in dramatically increase costs. Those would, be, would impose, if anything, incremental costs. A lot of that is just having skills um, in your team and, and just doing things more efficiently. Um, so, you know, I... I get that not not every bit of software needs to be tested as thoroughly as an international software uh, international space station update, but um, you know I would say that when you're when you're talking about an operating system that's used by hundreds of millions or perhaps billions of people around the world, and productivity applications that are used by hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people around the world then um, there is a um, uh, responsibility there to um, uh, make sure that stuff works before you throw it out on an unsuspecting public. So, you know, there's, there's a balance. And given, given the, the total absence of accountability that software companies have for quality, I think balance is in the wrong place at this point in time. Uh, Wendy says, you suggest less frequent updates. How do you balance this with companies that are moving towards Agile? Well, just because you are creating potentially shippable software every two weeks or three weeks or four weeks doesn't mean you have to ship it. Um, and there can be processes that are in place after a 
um, release is uh, developed that uh, further mitigates risks. Again, I talked about things like beta testing and A-B testing and so forth. Um, you know, so this uh, this rush to just get it out there, get it out there, get it out there again, I think there's just been this, this total fallacy of, of, you know, fast failure is fine and so forth. Well, it's, it's fine unless you're the one whose thermostat doesn't work or you're the one who's sitting opposite of a sheep pasture in Dublin wondering where the airplanes are or you're the one whose cell phone doesn't work for a week. You know, I think there's just been a, a lot of lackadaisical attitudes about software testing and, and the overriding need to be fast, 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 um, you know, that uh, are, are not sustainable uh, um, over time. Um, you know, I mean, I think we've, we've seen some examples of that kinds of, a, those kinds of uh, trying to speed things up and taking shortcuts approaches in other uh, forms of industry. There was some uh, uh, famous reports out of China about some bullet trains that were um, assembled in a, in a somewhat hasty fashion, um, and they started having some, some very significant problems. Um, also, you might remember in Sichuan province in China, there was some, some shortcuts taken with respect to concrete used in schools, and then there was an earthquake. Um, which of course a collapsed school and dead children is a tragedy in any country, but in a country with a one-child policy, um, you know, up until recently, it's it's that that compounds that tragedy even further. And you can say, well, yeah, but these are you talking about trains and schools? Well, look, I mean, software is getting to be part of the critical infrastructure of society. The whole Internet of Things is just going to make that all the more so. And, um, you know, I just think that uh, um, we're going to have to start, you know, acting like a mature profession here and acting like what we do matters be because it does. Um, so speed, you know, speed to market is, it is not everything and shouldn't be everything. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to comment from Amit here. One thing that might make updates a bit less horrid is some sort of device standardization or at least a standard API between layers. One of the things that makes upgrades more difficult is that we need to try and assess the impact on a gazillion different configurations. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with that. That is an excellent suggestion, Amit. If, uh, if I ever do this presentation again, I'll try to remember that, some standardized interfaces because... Um, yeah, you're you're right. I mean, this is uh, that's that's something that just kills us. Is uh, there's all these different interfaces and devices and so forth, and the more that we could standardize, the better off we'd be. And you know, you mean you see this, you see this all over the world, right? I mean, there's there's basically, uh, you know, 120 volts, uh, give or take, or 240 volts, give or take. And most devices now, well, a lot of devices, can plug into either, right? And there's 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Um, but again, that usually doesn't uh, affect a lot of devices, right? So, so we've managed to standardize for the most part on, on household electrical current and also distribution grid current. Um, you know, we, we've, we've standardized on a number of things. We've standardized on, on gasoline um, that's used as a fuel. You know, there, there are various grades, but, I mean, gasoline is, for the most part, gasoline. Um, and, and that obviously makes things a whole lot easier, right? I mean, if you imagine if, if you know, gasoline had, was ranged in, you know, from all sorts of different viscosities, and something that was more or less along the lines of somewhat liquid, you know, paraffin all the way, all the way up to kerosene, you know, I mean, it's uh, standardization definitely makes things a lot easier. So that, that would be a very helpful uh, advance. <laughs> Amanda says, uh, I missed a few minutes toward the end of your presentation due to a failure of my system that required reboot. Great timing. Question is how to best be an advocate for solid engineering practices within an organization if I'm not management. How to get upper management to value quality over quick releases without sounding lazy or negative. Um, thanks. Great stuff. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's important to not sound lazy and to not sound negative. And so when you're, here's something I, that probably a number of you heard me say before. Um, when you are trying to advocate for change in an organization, um, don't talk about how the problem that you're trying to solve through this change makes you uncomfortable or makes you sad or makes you frustrated or, or causes you pain. Talk about how it causes the organization pain. Talk about the cost of the organization, publicity problems, and so forth. And then come forward with a concrete solution, something that's actually, you know, can be demonstrated to connect to that. So, so rather than just saying, uh, you know, we had this really massive um, uh, PR disaster with our last release, so I suggest we do more testing. You know, no, talk about what specifically needs to be tested more to address the kind of thing that got out last time and talk about why it wasn't just a fluke, but it was a risk that you guys have been taking over and over again that this time blew up on you. Because, uh, I mean, the, the, the key things here, again, pain as a motivator of change. Uh, for the most part, um, organizations are like people in, in terms of this, that they, they are going to move away from pain much faster than they would move towards a desirable situation. So you can talk about stuff we could do that would make our company better, and people might go, yay, that sounds great, we'll get to it tomorrow. Uh, but when you are talking about here's a way that we can avoid losing millions of dollars or losing thousands of customers, other kinds of organizational pain, you know, that's likely to get people's uh, attention. And again, you know, focus on the organization's pain. Don't don't ever make it about your pain because, you know, nobody cares about your pain. Um, Scott says standard interfaces are bad for cybersecurity. I don't. I I guess that's maybe. Uh, I'd I'd have to hear a lot more than that assertion to agree with that because I mean I think we use things like HTTPS and FTPS um, and other sort of standardized interfaces, which uh, when properly utilized are uh, are very good for cybersecurity. The whole public key in, uh, infrastructure. Um, that's all standardized. Um, you know, I mean, that's the, the, to the extent that there that there are practical um, security approaches out there. Um, a lot of those are based on standard interfaces. Now, if you're making the security by obscurity argument here, Scott, I think that's been pretty thoroughly debunked by security experts that would say that you know, counting on somebody not being able to figure out how some interface works as a way of securing that interface. I mean, I, I don't know, when I, when I went through and, and was studying security a few years ago, about 10 years ago or so, got my security certifications, uh, uh, you know, the whole concept of security by obscurity was something that was very much looked down on. So if what you're saying is, you know, let's have, um, uh, you know, these obscure interfaces so no one will be able to figure out how to get into something. I just I just don't think that uh, security best practices align with that. Amit says uh, in, in that uh, context, he said, I would add to that when dealing with encryption, the first rule one encounters is don't implement it yourself. Use standard libraries, right, because you're just going to make some mistake, right? And then he further says, uh, I mean, he says, so standardization helps in security, not the other way around. That, that, again, that's been my, what I've been taught to believe as well. Uh, Jesse asks, how do you effectively utilize automation, automated testing with software that is changing? Well, um, getting away from the user interface uh, when you're doing your automation is, is a first big step towards that. Um, the user interface needs to be evolving and changing over time for purposes of adding functionality and improving usability and of course also portability dealing with new devices that come along so anytime you're you're automating through the UI you are necessarily automating through one of the most change prone and brittle interfaces that you could possibly automate so, you know, to the extent that you can move your test automation away from the graphical user interface and towards things like APIs, 
and, and standardized reports that the system can produce and queries and, and other stuff that can be dealt with through um, automation via, via APIs, via scripts and, and those sort of things and, and using tools like grep and awk and so forth which are pattern recognition and filtering software available on Unix boxes that also are available on uh, Windows boxes. Uh, you, you can really get to building some very, very maintainable um, automation approaches that uh, target the business logic uh, right underneath the user interface. And then, of course, you need to do some amount of testing to make sure that the user interface is still uh, properly uh, hooked up to that functionality. And, you know, some amount of automated graphical user interface testing um, through the more stable parts of the graphical user interface might very well make sense. But, you know, I, I sort of feel like, I mean, I've been involved in automated testing ever since I started programming because I created automated unit tests for my programs back in 1983. And I feel like the big push towards um, trying to automate through the graphical user interface, which kind of started with tools like XRunner, which became WinRunner back in the 90s, and, uh, oh God, whatever that other one was, Linda Hayes' tool that she was selling back in the 1990s. Uh, I just think that was a step in the wrong direction. I think we, with this, this people, from, as a marketing slogan, uh, these tool vendors going, well, you know, if you're not testing it exactly the way the user is going to test it through the user interface, you're not really testing it. That was a really clever marketing slogan, and like a lot of marketing slogans, is misleading. You can get at the business logic, you can get at the data, the underlying data, uh, a lot of different ways, command lines, APIs, uh, queries, uh, um, reports, and so forth, and, um, um, you know, just try, try to stay away to the extent you can from the graphical user interface, because, as I said, that's the one of the least stable, most brittle um, at interfaces to automate through. Uh, let's see, Tony says, uh, speaking of implied warranty of fitness for software, it seems like most software today comes with a uh, user agreement with language stating that the software is not at all meant for any any purpose or fit for any purpose. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm talking about, those, those, uh, those click wrap or um, those agreements where basically you read it. It's like it just basically says, we don't guarantee this software will do anything. And, I'm, and what I'm saying, oh, and, and furthermore, if it doesn't do something and that causes a problem, you can't sue us, you agree to arbitration. And I'm just saying that that's just, just, just complete horse droppings. I mean, that should that, they just shouldn't be able to do that. Uh, that. There should be an implied warranty of fitness if you bought it, um, you, and you bought it to, that it was supposed to do a certain thing, then it should do that thing. Now, Now, to some extent, I will say that if you didn't buy it, you don't have you don't have standing right so you know if you're upset at Facebook if you're upset at Twitter uh, if you're upset at LinkedIn uh, I'm like flaming LinkedIn occasionally because they, they've got some problems with their software but but I understand that basically I am I'm not the customer I'm the product there I'm basically I'm I'm the the person that they're they're paying customers or paying that 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 company to get at so I, I wouldn't really have standing but you know, the advertisers and so forth would, right? But certainly in the case of Microsoft, um, you know, where I pay for an operating system, I pay for um, Office. Uh, in the case of my phone and the software, some of the software that's on that phone that comes from AT&T, you know, other software that I paid for, absolutely, there should be no contracts of adhesion and there should be an implied warranty of fitness. And, um, you know, if... if garbage gets shoveled out onto the heads of users, then there should be a, a price to pay for that. My opinion. Of course, this is all my opinion, so it's, it's my webinar. Um, all right, so Amit says, uh, about the engineering stuff, is it even a good idea to try and become a form of engineering? There's very little in common between the static problems of engineering and the extremely dynamic environment in which software lives. Uh, I don't know. You go listen to my webinar on the towards a true form of engineering. I, I just, I don't, I don't agree. Um, I, I think that if you're going to have 
um, you know, software is becoming part of the critical infrastructure of society and civilization, and um, that 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 can't be Jello. Um, the problem is at this point, it's it's too dynamic. Uh, let's see. Tony says your less frequent, larger releases, when wherever possible, proposal goes against the current DevOps trend. No. Um, there's a push to release software often. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, <laughs> there, there's a famous, famous comment by a guy named William F. Buckley uh, years ago of, uh, that he saw him, himself as, as his role as standing, standing athwart the tide of history yelling stop. And uh, sometimes I kind of feel like that myself. Of, uh, I see stuff. See, I see trends developing in, in our industry, and I see um, people making comments on, on Twitter and Facebook and so forth. Now, the Twitter and Facebook stuff is easier to dismiss because, you know, stupid stuff gets posted on Twitter and Facebook all the time. But these developing trends in our industry that I see sometimes are, are like, really? Is what the world needs more crappy software delivered more frequently? Is that actually what the world needs? I mean, if so, I mean, if a client, one of my clients says we're using DevOps and we want to be, you know, in, in continual deployment, then, you know, I say, okay, well, you know, my job as a test consultant, as a test professional is to help an organization uh, do the best it can under the circumstances in which it finds itself, right? As a tester, you play the hand you're dealt. But, you know, as a, as a software engineering professional in general, I mean, I sit back and say to myself, more crappy software delivered more frequently? Is that actually what the world needs? And I, I think the answer is no, clearly. Um, you know, I, I don't, I have a, I have a Ford F-250 truck, 2002 version of the truck. I bought it in late 2001. The truck has 85,000 miles on the thing. It's very simple. Are there more recent versions of that truck? Yeah, and guess what? Most of them are, are bad compared to that version of that Ford truck. People see that. I drive that Ford truck in to get service, and people look at that and go, oh, my God, that's the greatest F-250 truck ever built, that model. I don't need a new truck. <laughs> I'm, I'll be happy to drive that truck until I can't drive a truck anymore because they're wheeling me off into the old folks' home, and I'm like, hey, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, what was my name again? Um, so, no, you know, I'm happy to have one truck that maybe doesn't have a whole lot of bells and whistles, but it does exactly what a truck should do, and I'm happy to have that truck until um, I don't need a truck anymore. Uh, and I think there's just too much of this bells and whistles, you know, flashy new features, but, you know, lots of crap that doesn't work. So, yeah, count me as, um, count me as deeply skeptical on the whole DevOps thing. Again, hap I understand what's happening and I understand why it's happening and I'm happy to help clients that have to live in the DevOps world try to optimize their testing in that world but uh, you know not I'm not a fan uh, let's see Amit has a question here on uh, about warranty of fitness could it really work in most cases I can see it working in the case of Apple or, or Microsoft that maintain their own ecosystem, but wouldn't such an initiative just provide more work for lawyers when technology companies will break stuff in one another's products? For example, Google changing an API, an OS update renders some feature in an application obsolete or broken. Uh, which of the companies is responsible? Yeah, well, this is what lawyers are for. I mean, You'll remember that, uh, or you might remember that uh, about 20 years ago, give or take, um, there was this big um, argument between Firestone and Ford over whose fault it was that Firestone tires were blowing up and causing Fords to have rollovers and, and people got killed. Um, whose, whose fault was that? And there were lawsuits and it went back and forth. Um, you know, that's, uh, sometimes that's what happens. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of, people like to sort of go, oh, yeah, darn lawyers and, you know, it's friction on our economy and so forth. But, you know, uh, regulation is necessary in some cases to uh, uh, make sure that people do what they're supposed to do. You know, as uh, the Jefferson quote goes, if, if 
if people were angels, we wouldn't need government, <laughs> you know. Uh, but people aren't, and businesses certainly aren't. And uh, you know, you see plenty of cases where large um, organizations basically lorded over their smaller customers through things like no implied warranty of fitness and contracts of adhesion and so forth. So, um, and again, if if that slows things down a little bit in the software world, I'm okay with that. I don't I don't worship at the cult of fast. Um, I you know I'll, I'll maybe bow down to the cult of good, uh, but not the cult of fast. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Matt says, thanks for a worthwhile webinar. I especially appreciate the comments and perspective on Agile, DevOps, etc. I've been wondering about the quality compromise, and you answered that. Uh, Matt, well, thanks. I'm glad to, glad to resonate with you. I mean, this is, um, as, as webinars go, I mean, a lot of my webinars are sort of focused on delivering specific content and techniques and so forth. The last couple have really been more sort of philosophical and I sort of felt the need to get some things off my chest about some stuff. Um, we'll be shifting gears uh, here back to stuff that's that's more practical and less, uh, maybe less reflective uh, uh, over the summer. But uh, I do think it's important for us to, to think about this. I mean, we, you know, we are part of a profession and uh, you know, being being part of a profession does involve thinking about the 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 role that you and your your profession serve in society. Um, and when people who are in a profession don't think about the role that they and their profession serve within society, then um, you know bad things happen. I mean, history is replete with examples of professions and professionals of various kinds that got co-opted into participating in some really evil crap. And uh, so, you know, not that I'm saying that what, what's going on with, you know, frequent software updates crosses the line into evil, but it certainly some of it crosses the line into careless. And so I think we, uh, we, we just, we need to spend some time thinking about this. <laughs> Lena says, thank you. So agree with your F-250 example. <laughs> Yeah, I love love my truck. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, so we got a last comment from a meet here, and then we'll we'll shut it down. He says, "Just remember this cute lecture I saw the other day about serendipity and testing and ways to invite serendipity in. I think that while it won't solve the upgrades problems, it definitely could help a bit at the professional at the personal tester level." And then he's got this link here. Let me see. I'm going to try to send this link to everybody. I haven't watched this, so, but I will. Yeah, here's the link. If you want to take a look at it? That's per Amit's recommendation. Um, so thanks for passing that on. I'll take a look at it after we get done here. And thank you all for attending. Um, to uh, close the session. Um, as usual, a little song and dance about our free resources. So the webinar sessions once a month continues, seven years and counting. Uh, go to our new and improved rbcs-us.com website to sign up. Uh, of course, we do these webinars uh, on, on this topic or any other testing-related topic. You uh, can do this for your company as a special webinar presentation, so send us an email, info at rbcs-us.com. Um, our free newsletter also, our, sign up at rbcs-us.com. This will get you some valuable, in some cases, pretty, pretty large discounts on our consulting and training services. And you get every other month a newsletter with an article on software testing and what we're up to. Uh, we're on Twitter and Facebook, as you can see here. Remember, the Like a Test Dog is my personal account, so if you don't care about any sort of spoutings off I might have about this disgraceful presidential election that we're having in our country right now or anything else, just go to the RBCS one. Uh, do remember to check your email over the next couple of days because you could be the lucky winner of a free e-learning uh, course. Uh, you are registered simply by attending. Um, and uh, remember also that this uh, webinar and all the other webinars have been recorded and will be posted on uh, our website and on our uh, YouTube channel and on iTunes and our RSS feed. So. Lots of lots of ways of getting at these free resources, and of course all of the templates and videos and so forth that are out on our website as well. All free resources as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. 
Uh, thanks for attending, and uh, see you uh, next month.